Hi, welcome to this episode of Prophecy for the Last Hour. I'm Liz McGee, and I'm going to share another teaching today. I wanted to make a couple of quick disclaimers here. I have started to record, in, oh, this is really funny, in my home, and I have a green screen, which I'm not 100% sure on all my technology yet. So there's a little uh, things that go on in the background that I haven't quite figured out how to um, completely take care of or fix. A lot of this fuzziness that goes on, like this green that's going on right here. So if anybody has technical ability and can in comments help me, I would love it. So uh, one of the backgrounds I've been doing is I just want to tell you, I am a tent maker. Paul was a tent maker. Even he had a ministry of teaching the word, but he also, um, and I believe this is our model for today. He was a tent maker. And so I'm an artist on my day, my quote unquote day job. And I do watercolors and I teach watercolor. And uh, so my backgrounds, this is what you're seeing. This is one of my paintings. It's called Portico. I can see it. And um, it's an area, it's a beautiful garden area and building in my area. And so that's what I'm just using as my backgrounds. So, but I do, I, I want to say as a tent maker, I have an, uh, a website, uh, Liz McGee. I have a Facebook page, Liz McGee Watercolors, and I also have an Etsy page. And I do sell my artwork as prints up, oh, sorry, online. So if you ever want to check that out, that's just something you can do, whatever. So today I want to talk again about code words, keys to the kingdom, the way the encrypted understanding in our Bible, because I'm, I'm getting a little concerned because as I kind of you know, do scan what other people are teaching and saying out there in the uh, world of YouTube Bible land, I guess you'd call it. You know, there are some, obviously there's a lot of things I agree with, a lot of things I don't agree with. I think we're all on a journey. A lot of serious, the serious researchers, we're all on a journey. We really just have the Ruach to walk this with. We're kind of all out of our comfort zone a little bit, definitely out of our um, most likely Orthodox Church uh, boundaries, per se. But that's all part of the necessary territory that has to be covered in this last day and age as we get back the oil for our lamps, the true understanding. I'm also, my eyes are like, I must be, it's allergy time also. So I, my eyes are watering like crazy. Anyways, <laughs> you see incense in the background. I'm starting to burn incense. I'm starting to do um, a lot of things I do because I have a more understanding. I, these things aren't scary to me anymore. I get it. The deep spiritual significance, it isn't like incense in and of itself has anything. It is understanding when you couple something in the natural, let me put it this way, with its true spiritual understanding, there's power. There is power. That's why there's power in the name of Yeshua. When you truly understand who he is, who we are in him, what's going on, you uh, there is power in all of this. And I would say knowledge is power. But um, I'm going to talk a little about incense today. I want to talk a little bit about um, salt. I want to talk about oil and anointing oils. And these are some things that I have started to use personally to um, completely keep the atmosphere around me, uh, especially in my home, peaceful and calm. I feel protected. I feel totally under the, the covering of Yahweh. I have great serenity and peace. And I do think my home and those that live, we, we live together at home with my husband and son, but family members, we're at a place of, of much greater harmony. And I do think a lot of this has to do with properly and appropriately accessing uh, something that um, is available to us. It's talked about in the Bible, and a lot of our patriarchs do these things, have done these things. We have many examples, and so I want to share a little bit on that. But I'm going to start with um, a couple of teachings or things that are going around out there that I think are kind of scary, because I don't think that uh, sometimes we have the full picture. Now, uh, I, you know, I'm going to wear this proudly. I am, okay, so I'm becoming, I am not in, but I am beginning to understand and go into the territory, and I, my life goal before Yahweh, uh, Yeshua returns, if it's a month or if it's whatever, um, I'm a Kabbalist. I understand now that the deepest 
sod level, mystery level understandings for our day and time have been kept by the House of Judah, I've said this many times, in their literatures, in what is called here, um, and many times it's in the apocryphal writings, it's uh, the hidden, the upper wisdom, the um, in their deep Torah writings, okay? And I talk about exoteric and esoteric knowledge. So I'm comfortable, so I'm gonna wear proudly. So, and technically, this is just another sign that we are at the end of the age. We are ready to go into a new paradigm, a new millennial. Yeshua's in his, because technically, traditionally, women were not allowed to be Kabbalists. This was never anything technically or normally that women would pursue. So the fact that, and many traditional Jews even today would not recognize uh, this path, so to speak, okay? But that's all tradition, and that's a lot of that's going by the wayside. The thing I want to say is, and that's it, when I use these words, and I purposely do this, and I have to do this because Yah's calling me into this, I'm not afraid, and you don't need to be afraid. There is true Jewish Kabbalah. I'm not talking about what's out there. I'm not talking about the what the dark side has absconded and puts forth and uh, I don't care what Manly Hall says. I don't care what these quote-unquote Illuminati secret societies want to do with quote-unquote their darkened understanding of Kabbalah, okay? It's dark, it's partial, it's unclean, it's not holy before the Lord. They will answer for it. If you're in that, get out. Get back to the root, the Jewish root that we have. There is truth in the house of Judah. And this is what I have to say to people is, if you've been reading all the extra biblical literature and stuff and you have stopped short of the Kabbalah and you still are afraid, okay, because fear is not from God. So you have to really check yourself if you have fear. Uh, who gave you that fear? Is this a spin? See, Hasatan has put a spin on this. He wants to keep the true seekers, the true elect, away from this for as long as he can. So we need, and we need to master this because... And it's huge. I'm not doing it alone. Uh, the Jews have not necessarily been as forthcoming through the centuries of this whole body of knowledge, and for good reason, okay? But now it's a time we're revealing ourselves to each other, and there are some really great Jewish Kabbalists, which is a person who has, like, mastered the curriculum. This is why you have to understand this, how these words are used. They master the curriculum. They're able to teach it and impart it. And, and so these are technically, truly Hebraic sage and scholars today. Just stay away from everything that's just doesn't give the glory to Yah, does not recognize Yahweh Elohim, the God of Israel, uh, just stay away from all the other stuff, okay? It's garbage. I'm, if I if people want to keep lumping me in with that, I don't really care, all right? You know, you're, everyone's going to give an account, so whatever. But um, there's a couple of just, I'm going to go through this really quick, because it is in the understanding how the words are used Kabbalistically, which is going to unlock the true meaning and is going to bring together sort of heaven and earth. Okay, the spiritual understanding and then its earthly application. See, this is the thing. There is a world that is visible. That's what everybody, that there is a world that is invisible. All right. And it is the two worlds are really working together. We just don't most of the time, 90% of the time, we just don't really get it or understand it or work with it. Our ancients were much more savvy at this. So anyways, there is a teaching that's going on that the name Yahweh, because people are trying to unpack as we get back into the names of Yah. Um, he's not many, many names are ascribed to him. So what's up with all that, first of all? Because a lot of us are Ephraimites trying to look through us at, at the Jewish sage mind. We were not schooled in Torah from children. We don't really understand the length, breadth, depth of height of what we're really dealing with. We've always thought it was just sort of this... New Testament Christianity thing that and, and the rest of it. And that's just, again, that's Satan put you in a box. Sorry about that. Okay. We have a heritage. We have a root that we've been wrapped into. And it takes a lot of retooling of your mind to kind of understand the, what we're dealing with here. Okay. So Yahweh, um, there's a whole school of people that, that want to say that Yahweh, divorce him from Yahweh Elohim. Okay. Those are words. Those are Hebrew 
transliterated words for the actual Hebrew um, is, is that the, the Yahweh of the Old Testament is not the Yahweh Elohim, um, the, what most people understand is the Godhead, but that he is really the God, the Baal, okay, of the heathen, the, the, the um, you know, if you understand, I can't go into this, the, the other side, the Sitra Arka, the rulers of the dark side, okay, so that that Baal, which means Lord, so he is the Lord, he really was the Lord of the Baals, was really the Lord of Israel, his name was Yahweh, I mean, what could be more, see, people don't understand, you, you don't, you just don't really understand what you're dealing with, so the Yahweh is using the Old Testament, is not, the God of Israel is not the Baal of the heathen nations. They're not, it's not the same, okay? So to try to um, parcel it out and divorce Yahweh, in the same Elohim, the Lord, Elohim God, okay? It is talking about the holy God. It's, it is our, Yahweh is our God, okay? And you can be comfortable saying it understanding it but you must understand it from the hebraic really henotheistic um understanding now the other one is the word elohim i mean people is really funny are like all over the place because elohim you understand el el is word for god yeah and oh he is plural so it's a plural you're talking about plural gods and that's like tripping everybody up like because it's poly you know many gods is polytheism and we're supposed we're told you know that hero israel the Lord your God is one, so that we worship one Yahweh. We do, but the word Elohim, it's not when it talk, when it's using the word other gods. It's not other gods. Okay, we're not talking about other, literally other gods, lesser gods. We are still talking. We are still totally in the Godhead. We are actually in the Trinity. We are in the upper Godhead where where it's used. Elohim is used in a sense, and I understand this now Kabbalistically. I can't flush it all out. This is the full potentiality Elohim, of, of Yahweh. He, he, he's so, this is, and this is what's true. He's so able. He's so powerful. He, it looks like many gods. I mean, most people say, there's got to be many gods doing all this stuff. I mean, how can one person just have all that power to do all that, you know, in the universe? Okay, so in, in one sense, and this is when, it, when people have no understanding, and this is what the pagan nations did. They kind of parceled it out. They started worshiping the parts instead of the whole. Elohim is it's used biblically in our Bible, and in, in its in its deepest understanding, it's it's a word that is sort of and, and it represents Bina, the mother, the potentiality. I am a mother. I have the potential. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I had two boys. I have having tons of kids. Okay. This is the thing, the potentiality in some of the roles of Yah. Okay. So that's sort of where, so you don't have to worry in the Godhead when it says Elohim that, that it is really referring to other, literally lesser gods, different gods. It's talking totally different. We're still in a unified one God, one Yahweh, Elohim, but with unbelievable potentiality the the seeds the ge genesis of, of everything that's ever been created and, and everything that was ever in the mind of god is in this word elohim okay so much power and potential this is the all right so the other one is and so then what happens when you don't have that understanding so all of a sudden you got this this yahweh <laughs> who's really the lord baal who has um is a plural God now and has many Elohims, many gods associated with them. So then it's these quote unquote Elohims, these gods that have been making everything. And that not only that, but they're the ones who made the man, the Adam in his, in, in their image and likeness. I mean, so this is where, you know, one error just spreads out until you got a football field full of just error. It's crazy. So this, and this is really, serious because a lot of people don't do their homework they just listen to people and they like and it does lead you away from the truth and eventually you know your ship can get shipwrecked okay your faith when we get into these deeper understandings when when gentile christians get out of the boat and really try to understand the, the height breadth depth and width of our hebraic understanding you have to it's 
it's extremely deep and you can get lost in it in the sense if you're not properly rooted because many of us do not are not taught hebraically technically a jew you'd go to a yeshiva you would be taught under torah teachers it would all be taught to you line by line precept by precept understanding by understanding you would build the thing on a sure foundation many of us don't have that advantage okay we're just reading the writings we're trying to figure it out we're not really in a disciple uh, to master teacher relationship or teacher to disciple relationship. Okay. Um, you know, it's something that the early church really did start out with. It's true. Sorry. Um, but you know, we, we've lost all this. Our priests, our teachers are <laughs> sort of the blind leading the blind. Sorry about that. So this whole thing, the Elohim, when the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim made man in his image and likeness, trust me, it is 100% holy in the godhead okay we are still talking about the one god our father the creator god and all it means is it made he made us the his sons and his adamic in his image and likeness and again image and likeness two different words two different concepts the body and the soul this whole thing there is a great meaning in that i'm not unpacking that tonight but so this is another important thing okay so you can be, you can rest assured that we are made in the image and likeness of Yahweh Elohim. The other thing, the fourth one, you know, this one cracked me up because I just was listening to this and huh, many of the truths, well, all the truths of spiritual understanding have been kind of handed down and given to us in uh, typology or allegorically that oh my gosh i am just my eyes are going crazy today so sorry allegorically by things that we know and understand okay so one of the things somebody was saying how paul they were trying to make out paul to be a that maybe he was a mason really he was really a, a secret this is some secret society freemason um because he called himself a wise master builder and we do know that a lot of the typology the masons yes they have stolen <laughs> They have occulted, they have, and use in dark, nefarious ways, and, and just as an affront to Yahweh, because they know a lot of times we're stupid, and they, some, they have had more understanding of this knowledge, and um, it's just a dig in Yah's face, but anyways, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, just because you use a word, you can't, if you're not, you, uh, you can't superimpose presuppositions onto some of these words. So no, Paul was not a master builder in the sense of being a Freemason, but the fact that there is, there, the Bible is full of um, building terminology. I mean, Yah is building a house, you know, we're his house, house of prayer today. He's building um, a new heaven and a new earth. I mean, Yah is the master builder, so to speak, okay? Um, Paul was building on a foundation, you know, the foundation being um, Yassad. This is an understanding. This is, he, Paul was, in my opinion, because I read Paul and I get it now. I know he gets it. He was in a scene. He studied all this understanding. He, he has the deeper understanding, the Kabbalistic understandings. Uh, he was building on a foundation that was a sure foundation. Okay, so it's just some of these things it can get, and so this is what I want to say, if people, they need to go the third level, the third way, in my opinion. Oh, I had this, I was going to show you this book. There is, you know, I tell people, you should just buy a copy of Daniel Matt's The Zohar, volume one, cost you about $35 on Amazon. Believe me, you're only going to get to read three pages a day. It's very meaty, very heavy. It's, it's exceptionally annotated, and it will begin to explain to you what I'm talking about. But there's another book out there, Oh gosh. And I'm going to put it, I'm going to put a link. I'm going to put a link in that actually is about Kabbalah that someone else turned me on to Abiyahu. And it actually does give a very good foundation of a lot of these concepts because see, when I talk Kabbalistically, what I want people to understand, we are talking about a philosophy, a theology. We are talking about the Hebraic worldview, philosophy and theology 
and how they expressed it. See, something at Gentile Christians we didn't even know was already fully developed. <laughs> you know, we sort of make it up. Jerome, many of the early church fathers at least knew that there was a foundation. See, Paul totally knew it because Paul was a Pharisee. He, he totally, he studied under Camille. He had this whole, I mean, he was in a total yeshuva situation where he was taught precept by precept, you know, as a disciple. Um, all of his Hebraic, the philosophy. Now, it's one thing to have it, to, to rightly interpret the prophecies or what's going on. I mean, that's sort of a different animal. But, you know, and this is why Paul, he was zealous for the law. He was zealous originally for his understanding of it, how he, but the fact was that he was schooled totally in his Hebraic understanding, which really hasn't changed. I mean, this is the thing we understand about the Jews. It, 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 it's still pretty much what Abraham understood. It's, and a lot of this also we're understanding, yes, Abraham, and I'm going to get into my, my salt and my incense kind of understandings now. Um, it goes back to Enoch even further. What we're understanding, and this is a difference between, you know, an Enochian understanding. And what we don't understand or have lost the fact is that before the nation, it isn't like Moses, and it's true, didn't just write all this stuff one day. He himself totally knew the background, the history, the philosophy, the worldview of the righteous, and he was totally schooled in it. And as, um, even as a, in Heliopolis, as an Egyptian, we're understanding even the Jews, this whole, and I don't, you know, Israelites or Shemites. I mean, we have to understand before you could be a Christian, you were really, a, you know, or if you were a follower of the way before you, you coming out of it as seen understanding. Okay, they was the first, but even before that, so be, what I'm trying to say is, in a nutshell, before Moses, you had Enochian understanding. Enoch was the patriarch who kind of ruled from Enoch to Moses, and the righteous knew this Enochian understanding. And what we're seeing today is going back and we're getting an Enochian understanding, which is actually a little more, well, it's closer to the, in a lot of ways, it's a little truer. It's a little, it has, it has a lot more information in it because a lot of Jews today, unfortunately, and this is even my personal experience, I mean, they really don't want to go further back than Moses. They're comfortable with Moses. Moses is telling, but as we're understanding it today, there were still about 2,500 years of history before Moses. So there's a lot to understand. So anyways, salt and incense, oils, and then the biggest thing I have to, this is the biggest understanding. And this is why the first understanding in Kabbalah, which you try to have, is, is this concept, because this is how the words are used. We have a world that is visible and that is invisible. And actually, we have a visible world, but we have actually, you know, two levels of this thing that are kind of invisible to us, spirit and soul. So we're people who are made up of body, soul, and spirit. You can always see my body. You can always see the, the, manif the physical manifestation of matter in the world. But it's the next level up, the soul life, and the next, the highest level is, is the spirit, okay? And God is spirit. So I've tried to talk on this. This is really some deep stuff. But these are, you know, recognizes different dimensions, different, you know, and it, you know, try, again, trying to use words to explain this stuff. But the highest level of understanding, the oil, the gold standard. Okay, because these words are used. So when gold is used, it's used about the highest level of understanding. That's why oil is so big in the, the Testaments, Old and New. And by what Yeshua was um, the anointed one. He was fully anointed. He was, I say it's full of his mother, full of his father, meaning he was full of the, of the higher sephirah, the highest understanding. He was the most, and you say enlightened, he had the fullness of the God had the understanding dwelt in him bodily. Okay, he, he um, so these, these are how they're using these words. So oil um, is in its highest understanding, the mind, it represents also, uh, when you understand, because I haven't, 
totally done this. Oh, actually, I did it. I have to put it on my channel. The four elements that the ancients used. See, they used so many words to describe these, these realities. Uh, air, fire, water, and earth. The four elements, the four dimensions. Okay. You see, he said, fire relates to oil. And actually, I think I had this written down. Uh, well, let me just see if I can remember this. Because in the Sefer Yitzar, one of the deepest. <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't want to lose you people too much. But I'm having a great time because I'm getting it. Years and years and years of study is yielding um, great fruit. Okay, so what, because oh, I know, I'm sorry, 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 people. Just bear with me. What I told you before, you, you don't have to worry about the Godhead. The, 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 the Hebrews have a true understanding of Yahweh Elohim, which is an overarching phrase for the Godhead, which is really, and it's, it's symbolically portrayed in most ancient cultures and in the Hebrew world as the tree of life. This is what the, the tree of life represents what can be known is, you know, of, of the Godhead, of Yahweh, how we can wrap our minds around as much as we can what can be known about Yahweh Elohim, okay? It's also the, the same thing is used, um, the Adam Cademan, I teach and teach this. Paul alludes to this. See, Paul understands the cosmic, the body of Christ, the same thing. Christ is the word anointing. Okay, Christos, anointing, oil. Because oil represents, again, the highest level understanding, the spiritual mind, the mind of God, okay? Um, so these things are really kind of all talking about the same thing. It's not like they're all talking about different realities and everything. So if you can get one, you can get one archetype down, you can, it's a template, you can use it with the other. So whether I say Adam Caden, which was the macrocosm, this is the whole idea of the whole universe, this thing, see, most people think of the universe, they always think, they just think of the natural, material, physical world. But I'm telling you, your Bible is totally, that's just one fourth <laughs> of what the Bible's talking about. There is the world of the soul, the world of the spirit, and the, the, the high, even higher dimension of that, the high throne, the, the, the keter, the crown into the ensof, the, the, the omnipotent, omnipresent. Yeah, but... Adam Cademan is a phrase, the, the body of Christ is a phrase, the, the tree of life is a phrase, all these things that are talking about the whole um, macro, because macro is the big picture, macrocosm of, in the first chapter of Genesis is really giving you a picture of the whole in totally arcane language uh, of the body of, in, in, of um, Yahweh Elohim, his manifestation, the whole universe in, in all of its different dimensions. Now, does Yahweh really have a body? I mean, how else are we going to try to understand? You could use the word house. The temple is a great archetype of the same thing. And there's four levels in the temple. You have the outer court. You have the inner court, the court of the Gentiles. Then you have the inner court. Then you have the holy of holies. It's exactly the same template using different and and that's in in different words different mind pictures okay so you this whole thing of the 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 adam came in and this gets into the godhead the emanations of god the sephirah and if you knew the sephirah and you got into the hebrew words and then you did your word studies in your bible you would find out that the prophets were always using the names of god which lo and behold always turn out to be the names of the sephirah Okay, these are the, in the, the emanations of Yahweh. But, you know, the definition of an emanation is to come out from a source. The, what else would you call it? Ensof or Yahweh Elohim, he is the source. He is emanating out of himself a whole universe okay don't deny it it's it's around us we see it we're, we live in it's physical and we know this is the point that death is not the end of it if you're especially your soul is going somewhere this, these things okay these are realities that are happening 
so anyway, so once you understand this, and one of the, like you would use the word emanate, in, in a sentence it was used when I was looking it up on Google, it said, a sweet smell emanating from the blossoms. I mean, that's a beautiful picture. Because a blossom, and that's very Kabbalistic actually, because a blossom is a fruit. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're gonna stick with the archaeolog, or no, ar um, ar oh my gosh, agricultural, the agricultural archetype uh, from the tree of life, okay? Eventually you, put, you plant a seed. That is the first emanation. This in, okay, but eventually that seed puts in puts down roots, it shoots up a trunk, it gets into branches, it gets into leaves, it actually becomes a whole living cosmos, you know, eco eco center, ecosystem. Okay, people trees trees are great ecosystems. Okay, and trees are used hugely in the Bible as typology. A tree, we're referenced as a tree. Okay. We're, uh, here, let me give you this. This is a, a quote here from one, like a Zohar quote here. Um, there's a, a Psalm, Psalm 1 through 3. It talks about uh, a tree planted by the streams of living waters, right? In, in its, nobody's going to deny in its level in the material where there are trees that are planted by water. Trees have to be planted by water. But that's really talking about the seed of a tree being planted in waters, which is a dimension, which in its, and then it will produce itself a huge tree. But it also is on, a, on, a, on its um, a deeper level. Um, it's, 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 it is talking about, because the tree has roots, bark, sap, branches, leaves, flowers, and fruit. And actually there's seven kinds of all. Uh, it, that's its literal meaning. It's okay. It is the tree that it's talking about on a deeper level. Is he the person who is constantly occupies himself with the Torah? So this is the living water. See the Torah, the, we're the tree, so to speak. And if we are totally about the Torah, who is the word, who is, you know, the, it, that's our that's the emanation that we're tapping into right this is we are a tree planted by streams of living waters our living water the torah we know and so this this is how you just have to see how these these typologies keep circling around each other they never break um typology but the world tree so to speak again the tree of life this again is referring to the fact um that yahweh has set up systems and they work in all different dimensions. You have roots, you know, deep, deep, deep roots into spiritual realities that are producing things. We are, we are part of what's the tree of life, the branches and the leaves. We manifest, you can see us, okay? We're out of the ground where you can see branches, you can see leaves, and then you can see the fruit, and then you can see the bloom. You see the fruit, and that's our soul life. That's our manifestation of our actions. That's the final product. We actually... And that was the atom that was made in the image and like to the final end result product of all these processes that he had to put into, into operation uh, to produce these blossoms that appear on the earth. See, in the, on the third day, this gets into a lot of the way they use some of these words. So anyways, I wanted to talk about salt and incense, wrap this up a little bit, because, you know, truly I'm going to start, I always say this. But now that I'm pretty sure and I, I know I'm on the track and I know these things and I can connect the dots, kind of making some study guides or kind of writing this out a little bit to make it a little more um, linear and coherent for people who like to do things, you know, precept by precept and step by step. <laughs> but I'll tell you, it's been pretty daunting because, um, like I said, I, I wish I had been born uh, maybe in another life as, as a guy in a, in a great yeshiva under one of these great um, Kabbalistic rabbis. Oh, my gosh. So anyways, I oh, can just see that that's just, just freaking some people out. Whatever. Salt. Because uh, salt is a great weapon in spiritual warfare. I don't think this is one that we've really understood or utilized. I think people understand anointing oils. I mean, I have anointings on my home in the sense of we are atmospherically. And, and this is the, and I can't go into this, but there's pure physics to this thing. <sighs> 
uh, but salt, which refers to, in its highest level meaning, because we are the salt of the earth, right? That's one of the greatest New Testament phrases. Let me unpack this for you really quick. The salt of the earth. But if the salt is loose, it's saltiness. It's no good and should be thrown out. That's basically what he's saying. So what is he saying? I mean, we're not really salt, but if we're no good and get thrown out. So what is the deeper level understanding meaning here? Um, there's a, all right. First of all, so it refers to fire. It refers to a letter in the Hebrew letters, the Yod. And it is refers to fire. Okay, let me start with the highest different dimensions. Things manifest in different dimensions in different ways in the physics of it. This is the whole idea with the Trinity when they use the expression that it's, it's, it's like if it's water, it can be an ice cube, it can be a vapor and it can be water, three different states, the same thing. And this is how you help your mind to understand how something is in different dimensions. So salt is, represents fire, which is one of the dimensions, which the thing about fire is it glows. <laughs> and we're not talking about, I'm talking about fire in its ability to glow. It's to, to emanate, to emanate light. That's how it's used. Okay, so, and light, as it's used, refers to the illumination in the mind. So in other words, in its highest level understanding, salt is referring to, okay, well, how did I start that out by saying the comment, if you, you are the salt of the earth, you, the believer, <laughs> are supposed to have the highest level understand, understanding of spiritual truth. They, you know, Yahweh Elohim and his son Yeshua, you know, and is the gate, and this is how you get through this life into the next life, into heaven. Okay, so there's great understanding. If you don't have that basic amount of illumination or of spiritual understanding, okay, and you're the thought, what good are you? I mean, seriously, if I can't lead you into an eternal life, this is the whole point. If I can't explain to you that Yeshua is the gate, he is the door, he is the son of man that came and manifested and made a way back, so to speak, into the highest dimension, you know, what's the point? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to buy and sell you snake oil, and I'm not here to... Um, you know, sell you real olive oil. I want you to have the real oil, the true fire, the true understanding illumination. Okay, so that's sort of in its highest level understanding. And um, the Arabs, there's an Arabic saying to say that, that um, there, there is salt between us. Okay, because in, in the covenant, salt was used in the covenants, especially in the covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant of salt. In other words, and it's saying, in the Arabic saying, it says there is salt between, like we understand each other. If we have a salt covenant, you don't make a salt covenant with, this mean, like, do we understand each other now? I mean, if you're going to make a business deal and seal it with a salt covenant, that means like, okay, now we both are on the same page and we both understand the terms of this agreement. Think of it with Yahweh and Abraham. Okay. Abraham wasn't stupid going into this thing or any of them who made covenants. They understood what they were going into. They had illumination in their mind. They understood they were talking to the Most High God, Yahweh Elohim, who was making a covenant with them and their seed. So there was, there was partnership. There was true understanding on both sides. So to have, um, there is salt between us. So if we have lost this saltiness, if we don't have any, what good are we? Really and truly just thrown out and trampled like everybody else. We're no good to anybody if we don't have true spiritual salt understanding. So the other thing is, and like I said, this is where it represents in the salt of the covenant of the salt. There was understanding between the participants. Um, when another way that Elijah, there's a great story here in the prophets, they understood that this is why, because I just use salt as spiritual warfare in a situation. I salted a room. Okay. <laughs> I never thought, because, but like Elijah, I'm going to give you a practical demonstration. I understand now with my mind is my physical action is in agreement with my understanding in the name of Yeshua. Uh, there's power. Okay. This is not, 
why would I do this? I mean, there's power in understanding. So anyways, Elijah in 2 Kings 2.20, um, the people of Jericho come to him and they're very upset because the waters of Jericho have become polluted. They're bad. They're, they're, they're unfruitful. It's, it's, it's bitter waters. It's not, they can't use it. So again, just put that in a spiritual context. They have, they have no, their waters are dirty. They have, there's no, they can't get any life out of their water. So anyways, so Elijah says, well, bring me a jar. And he says, bring me a new jar. I didn't check the word in the Hebrew to think, but I must, hopefully it's a translated new jar. You can't, you got to put new wine. You can't put old wine in a new wine skin. You have to put new wine in a new wine skin. So bring him a jar and put salt in it. So he took the salt and he threw it into the spring, okay, the polluted spring, and he declared that, that he has now purified these waters, that there will be no more death or unfruitfulness in these waters, and the waters were healed. So it, but this is in its deeper level. This is talking about, again, if your stream of understanding, and this is like I was going back to the things in the very beginning, I was saying some of these understandings are getting skewered by people who don't have the true Hebraic understanding. They're starting to shit the mouths off, in my opinion, and, and that's getting a polluted stream going here, okay? The only way you can clean it up is to put salt on it, salt in it, and to purify it and say these waters have no more death or unfruitfulness in them because a bad stream, polluted stream, will eventually cause death and it will cause your crops will be unfruitful. They'll die. Nothing will grow. Up to life. So it all fits in that typology. So, um, and that's just a little bit on salt, uh, but I thought it was really interesting. So I want to talk about incense. Here's another word that uh, we just don't have the full. So, okay, so I've started to burn incense in my home a lot. Um, but oh, there's some great teachings on incense. Um, let me tell you that, that this is something we don't understand. The temple in Ye Jerusalem, in the heyday, so to speak, when the priests were really officiating, when they were really doing everything in accordance with Moses, and these were all object lessons. This is the whole point. They had the true spiritual understanding that what they were doing was affecting and being duplicated. This is the point. When I take physical salt and I put it as a warfare saying there will be understanding, there will be fruitfulness, there will be no more death or, you know, in the mind of this person, whatever, um, unfruitful works of darkness. These things have power to them. This is where heaven and earth are in alignment and they're working together. So what the priests were doing is they, they were working in alignment with the spiritual forces of heaven, with the emanations of Yah. They were working together. They were on the same page. They had understanding. This is what these rituals, these, these just weren't dumb rituals, but this is the point. If you lose your salt, if you lose your understanding of why you're doing something or what its true highest level spiritual understanding is, <laughs> you know, you're just genuflecting up and down and it's whatever. Um, but they could smell they were always to burn incense on the altar of incense, right? That was one of the major, major things that went on in the temple was the burning of the incense. And you could smell it for hundreds of miles. This is why Jerusalem was, it, there's a lot of the phraseology of a sweet smelling savor that, um, that would come from Jerusalem. Uh, she is a sweet smelling savor. When she's in righteousness and when she is in holiness, she is a sweet smelling savor to the nations. And people could smell the incense of Jerusalem a hundred miles away. And I think that's so beautiful. That's, you know, people would, as they would be traveling in for the feast, the first thing that they would get would be a waff, you know, a smell of the incense. And they would all get jubilant and excited because they, I mean, I just think that type is beautiful. So anyways, um, but incense is the one thing, I will tell you this, this is interesting, since we don't have the temple anymore, there's, we can't do, the Jews don't, any of the temple worship goes on anymore, because there's no more temple, there's no more altar, there's no more sacrifice, all these things are done away, okay, but the one thing that made it through, so to speak, 
is incense, the burning of incense. Because it, a lot of people, um, the Jews still burn incense. The Catholic Church, see, this is again where if you're an evangelical Christian and you, you have no clue, uh, the Eastern Orthodox churches still burn incense with a great amount of understanding. I think the Catholics have a little bit, a hint of it, a hint, I don't think they understand. But it is the burning of incense that has um, kind of gone through time and ha from the temple worship. This is one thing that we, we do. And I think this is the thing that people are beginning to understand again, because incense represents its prayer. See, and it's, it, it's communication. It is, um, it, it's an illustration. It represents the prayers of the saints that are always going up. Okay. And the one thing Yeshua did say, he said, my house, the house that I'm ultimately building, that where there's going to be activity in, is going to be a house of prayer for all nations. So it's, to me, it's very symbolic and it's very beautiful that it is the incense that is the one thing that has um, kind of gone through um, the destruction of the temple and is still with us today. So this is where incense, and there's some great teachings um, maybe I could put some links in on, and you should listen to some of the talk about the incense and how it was such a special, it was a formula. Moses was given this. Um, and let me just tell you, this, this is, uh, in, and this is why it was such a big deal in all ancient religions and worships there. This, see, as you'll find out that even the pagans had understandings of all of these concepts and they would duplicate it. They would, incorporate it they would profane it they would worship it offer incense to their gods i mean what a <laughs> you know they gotta pray to their gods like their gods are really gonna do anything so anyways um this is the in so he's making a house i was gonna say a house a new heaven which okay so this house is, is the new heaven and a new earth but what that means again this is a new See, Adam Cademan, see, Yeshua, we had the first Adam fell. Yeshua is referred to as the second Adam. What Paul's talking about is the fact that the, the first image and likeness did get, okay, uh, the first, did get corrupted, and it created the fall. It brought in death and unfruitfulness, okay? So Yeshua came, this is the whole point. He has restored us back into a place where we can um, tap back in, you know, back to our first estate, get back to the first dimension. Um, and the new heaven is, is another way of saying he is making all things new. He's making a new universe, a new Adam caveman. He's getting rid of all the viruses, all the death, all the destruction, all the negativity, everything that has been dogging us, the wrong, you know, including the people, <laughs> including the seed of the serpent, okay? If they don't want to have their genetics and people, this is, get rid of the mark of the beast, don't take the mark of the beast, become a new creation, part of this new heaven and new earth. Heaven represents your soul, it's spirituality, a new heaven. Everything in heaven will be, we know that there's fallen angels. We know that there are entities that are not in subjection to Yahweh. Oh, this is the story in your Bible. Um, and are not necessarily, they cannot get up to the highest heavens, The different, but they definitely operate in the Bible, tell you in the second and third heavens. Okay. But he's cleaning all this up. He's making a new heaven and a new earth. Earth represents to the material plane. Okay, he, we're going to get rid of, the rose is going to bloom in the desert. We are going to no longer despoil our, our ecosystem, our world. Okay, we're no longer through our greed and our lust and our, our just total cluelessness and carnality destroy the, the physicality of this beautiful universe that the Lord made. Okay, so the new heaven, the new earth, it's a new soul and it's a new body. See, these things all work together. So we, when Paul is saying you are members in particular of the body of Christ. It's like we're all little cells. We're all going to get plugged in back into the body. You know, some will be the hands, some will be the feet, some will be the mind, okay? And I said, this is all up to you. You know, if you want to be like a tree planted by living waters, you know, you want to be a Torah, you want to study Torah and get as much wisdom and understanding as you can, okay? Um, so anyways, so this is a, so this is what I'm saying is these are very important 
you know, I don't know, philosophical concepts, because this is what the ancient that we're talking. So my thing is, people need who are researchers need to start seriously reading again, because I don't hear a lot of these other teachers quoting from these bodies of work, the Dead Sea Scrolls from Philo. You need to read Philo. He's one of the greatest philosopher minds of the first century. He knew Yeshua. It's in there, believe it or not, okay? He was very acquainted with the Essenes. He was um, an Alexandrian Jew, which means he, and that's not, you know, the Bible says, for out of Egypt, I will call my son. I'm not going to unpack that, but the, the, the relationship to Egypt and to Israel, the, the, the people of Yah in Egypt has always been there, thousands and thousands of years, okay? You need to read, you need to read Clement, um, the, which is um, a disciple of Peter. Clement can be known to us today in the Nazarene Acts of the Apostles, a great text you can get by um, uh, Dr. Jackson Snyder. Or you just go online and Google Clement. These are some of the great works that we have that are coming back to us that are philosophically explaining to us the worldview, the mindset, the Hebraic understanding, okay? I mean, if you don't want to read, quote, unquote, the rabbis, you know, in the, the Kabbalistic Torah rabbis, okay, of which there are quite a few, I will admit that some of the rabbis did not have this Kabbalistic understanding. Oh, well, get yourself educated. Which ones did? Which ones didn't, Okay. So this is all understanding that, um, in my opinion, we need to keep plowing into this material. If you've been called to plow into this, you need to keep doing it. To me, it's, it's, um, it, it, it will just do wonders to um, help you connect dots, help you to have great spiritual wisdom and insight and understanding, to have oil in your lamp. And to help others, because one of the things that has really profaned, quote unquote, modern Christianity, because we just haven't had the depth of the understanding to take on a lot of the attacks and the assaults, you know, because people will just always taking it on its first level, its kindergarten level. Oh, yeah. Adam ate or, you know, Eve ate an apple. Like, that's really, that's really meaningful. <laughs> but it's so packed with apocryphal understanding. So, um I wanted to just end on this note here again. I'm putting these plugs in because I'm not ashamed. I'm not going to be intimidated. You can do what you want, but I understand the road I'm on. Okay. And I fully um, believe that Yah is looking with great favor and is filling me with wisdom and understanding. But in the Zohar, so like I said, I'm just telling, don't be afraid. Okay. And stick. So, anyways, I want to say this because. When you understand how these rabbis, because uh, I was I was listening to, to the again you got to understand the two houses of Israel and how Judah was given the birthright blessing, uh, spiritual blessing where they were to keep this information in their house, the house of Judah. This is why we go back to the house of Judah to our Hebraic patriarchs, be the Enoch, Abraham. Jacob or some of the great Torah scholars, even of the last 2,000 years, the Rambam, Rashi, the um, Moshe Cordovera, the Vilna, Vilna of Gaon, some of these guys. Educate yourself, okay? So, but about Torah, because it is written on these deep, deep levels, uh, I want to read two quotes to you. One of the guidelines in approaching scripture is to realize that it is not a history book, simply recording events that took place in ancient times. That is so not really. Nor is the Torah a collection of allegorical or mythological stories that are open to anyone's interpretation. Rather, the Torah is a cosmic code which ma which, whose mathematical-like notation is a string of equations that all together constitute one very large equation, which in turn are all condensed into the root formula, yav he vav he, the name of God. That the name of Yah. So many people are trying to unpack and find the, the you know, and be able to pronounce the name of Yahweh. But again, if you're an Ephraimite, you're not steeped enough in the, tr the, the length, breadth, depth, and height of Torah understanding and this whole 
world, so to speak, of the names of Yah. Moreover, the formulas of the Torah, also known as the scriptural verses, are rec records of recurring patterns that have been iterating, have been iterating throughout time and space, and even from before Spike's time as we know it. See, this gets into the deep physics of the Kabbalah, the understanding of light and vibration and, and voice and sound. These are the way they use these words. Um, there's a website I found. I thought this guy had some really interesting things to say. But most of the Torah, and this most of this information, I've been through this, the oral Torah, this is where it's been kept. Is this is something we need to understand. Um, and again, stop dishing the concept of the oral Torah, not understanding it and not understanding. Listen to my YouTube I did on oral Torah. I'm still learning this whole concept of how much the ancients valued the mind, the development of the mind, and how they, the retention, again, of knowledge and wisdom in the mind was there. They were masters at this. And the, 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 the how it would be the word, the, the, the ways in which they use different things, and there's a whole menomic, I don't know if that's, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, different ways in which they would make themselves wise, able to retain huge amounts of information in their mind. They always thought, they thought that writing it down was, a, was an inferior way of communication and mode of transfer. If you could contain it with your mind, you could always have it at your ready disposal. This is the true meaning of the word Kabbalah, which means a received transmission, which means you're receiving. Let me just say, th this tradition comes from a methodology that is almost, out, almost unknown outside of a number of small fraternities of Torah scholars. Without applying this methodology, is it impossible to understand what the intent of the Torah really is without this tradition, which requires a long process of study and meditation and um, of learning. This is why, you know, I was talking to somebody who was a Jew. He said, you know, Liz, you just don't understand what Torah study means to a Jew. <laughs> Our whole life, we're schooled for the very, it's drilled into us <laughs> how important Torah study is. For one thing, it's because they had a birthright. They had to keep this information within their quote-unquote house, and they did it, and it's done, and it's there. And as we go into this house, we need to have more respect, in my opinion, because I think the more we respect them, the more they will respect us. It works both ways. And, you know, stop all this name calling. And, oh, my gosh, I just get really sick of people um, just totally throwing out the baby always with the bathwater and not understanding. So it's just that, uh, you know, I guess that, again, it's just another plug for all this way of thinking. It's there. It's real. It's historic. And it is exciting to be alive today where Yahweh Elohim <laughs> is opening up all these rivers, this river of living water, so that we can um, totally immerse ourselves in all of this great wisdom and understanding because we're the light of the world. If we've lost our, or the salt of the world, if we've lost it, you know, what good are we? So anyways, on that note, I'm going to check out. I'll check in with you again next week with the teaching. Shalom and blessings in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach.